Well, thank you, Michael. I enjoyed your talk a lot, and you've just asked me how are we going to vote to stay in or out of the EU in the upcoming election. This is kind of a topic that I think everybody else is interested in because um, we have a lot of television coverage at the moment of the, um, uh, how shall I put it, the entertainment in how the Americans choose their future president. <laughs> And uh, one of the things I'm worried about is that the mayor of London is physically, he looks quite similar to um, one of the candidates for the American presidency in that he's got fluffy blonde hair. And I'm a bit worried that if you get a fluffy blonde president, we'll get a fluffy blonde prime minister. <laughs> Forward. Backward. Uh, Laser. Okay, great. So, yeah, thank you very much. Um, my name's Simon Burbage, I'm from Imperial College in London. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a kind of uh, background of high performance computing uh, at our university. Um, we're at a lower level than the talk Michael gave, which was talking about a large centre that's part of Prace. Um, a bit of background is that quite a few of our users are users of the Prace systems and users of the systems at HLS and um, in Europe. Um, what we try to provide for them is um, a kind of uh, a training ground so that they can develop their codes to um, run on those larger systems and to help them get funding for uh, their research. Um, so I'm also going to give you a, a little bit of background about what we do, the equipment we've got, and then what I think are some of the challenges for HPC um, which are on us at the moment and which will be coming up in the next couple of years. It's just a personal view, but I think it's something that might be uh, good to discuss. So we are a premier UK university and research institution. We have a larger proportion of research um, uh, than most UK universities. Um, these are some of the numbers that the university uses to, to rank itself, the Times Higher Education Supplement, um, these kind of things. Um, we have a large proportion of postgraduate students, larger than most universities, and we have a lot of staff who are dedicated to research. Um, we have a kind of luxury, at least from the HPC point of view, in that we don't have um, humanities and arts departments. It's science, technology, medicine, um, the business school. So I don't have the problem of trying to provide high performance computational French, for example. Um, our research income is uh, about £350 million pounds a year. Um, we have a lot of industrial research collaboration, um, which tends to be a little bit quiet. Um, the way it works is that the research departments themselves have collaborations with the industry, and when it comes to the computing, uh, if they need computing as well, that comes as part of the package. A little bit of a sidetrack, Imperial College is based in central London um, on the site of the 1851 Great Exhibition where Queen Victoria was showing off the, um, the might of the British Empire and industry um, to the rest of the world. Um, this is a picture of the um, Crystal Palace that was built on the site of where the university now is along with the Albert Hall, bits of Hyde Park, the Science Museum, the Victoria and Albert Museum. So if you're visiting London, um, visit the museums, but if you want to come and see uh, the college as well, you'd be very welcome. Um, it's a good example of legacy. Um, the legacy of that site is that there is a university there and there are world-class museums that people come and visit. So um, if you get a bit bored about the kind of whole legacy thing that comes in your justifications, this is an example of, of what can be done. So HPC, uh, we have a university-wide service. Um, all the departments just about in the university use the HPC service. Um, we've drawn it together um, by taking all the little clusters in the research groups and offering to provide equivalent replacement services to the groups to do that. And by and large, um, they much prefer to do that um, to the extent that we now have um, an annual budget of two million pounds for hardware and software for HPC, which is quite a lot. It's more than most UK universities. Um, at the moment, we have five dedicated HPC staff, which we'd like to um, increase that. Our most recent addition was somebody to do training, um, and that was primarily driven by uh, the desire to teach um, postdoctoral training um, for scientists who are moving into, on fast-track courses into um, 
their departments, but to teach them computing along the way because that's an essential part of their, of their work. Um, we happen to be at the moment the largest UK university system. Um, I think that's because I'm kind of cheap about buying stuff and I'll, I'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, I'm not bragging, it's just that we do have a lot of scientists and technology and it's probably about right for the number of scientists we have. So we have three systems, um, imaginatively named, CX1, CX2 and AX3. Actually, this one in the middle, uh, we've just upgraded um, and we did a bit for diversity um, by having a competition for naming the computer and doing a bit of publicity and it's been renamed Helen. Um, and Helen was the first uh, professor in Imperial College, Helen Porter. Uh, she was a chemist and the system is named in honour of her. So, backwards in terms of size, um, AX34, uh, actually two systems, two SGI UVs. Um, they are basically used mostly for bioscience and genomics in particular. Um, the users in that area don't have very well developed software and having a system with um, a very large shared memory and direct access storage um, means that they can run work very easily without having to bother too much about re-engineering their code to run at large scale. Um, The next one, CX2 or Helen, um, this is specifically for running very large MPI jobs and this is the platform that's used for people who are writing codes which are then going to move on to Prace systems or to some of those lovely big machines that you guys in the States have in your national labs and you very graciously allow us to run our codes on occasionally. Um, it's a, an SGI Altic ICE. Um, we've upgraded it a few times and recently done a major upgrade um, and we hope we might get into the top 500 um, in June with that system. Um, now, Michael said he doesn't care about the top 500. Well, I don't either, but if you're in it, it's quite good. Politically, it's a tool. I don't really care about the score, but if it gets you a position which you can advertise um, to your peers and your politicians, that's really kind of useful. Um, so um, this is a capability system for running very large jobs. Um, we're running um, jobs on one, two, three thousand cores, to give you an idea of the kind of size of work that's running there. And CX1 is our, in fact, our largest system. It's a kind of mongrel cluster. It's got all kinds of different hardware in it. Um, we have a program of uh, replacing the oldest hardware as and when we need to, i.e. when the computer room's full. Um, and we try very hard to get the cheapest hardware we can that does the job. So we'll do lots of negotiating with vendors, several different vendors represented in there, lots of different node types. And that system, if you like, is a kind of cloud. Because basically the users don't really know what they're running on. It provides them with a very convenient interface, which is a shell. They can run any application they want to, and we pre-install lots of applications using modules. So it's very easy um, if you know a bit of command line, um, know how to use the command line, or somebody's shown, provided you with a run script, you can run any of the applications on the system very easily and not have to worry too much about it. Um, I'm kind of saying it's cloud because I think the cloud concept is something that's not just about the mechanism by which you implement VMs and things like that. It's almost a use model in that the user regards the system more as a kind of black box and they don't really have to know too much about what's inside. I think when you move to the bigger scale, the scientists and the users of the system really do have to understand the technology because getting the performance out of it otherwise is really hard. Um, yeah, so we're running PBS Pro on the system. We run more than three million jobs a year. Um, I only noticed that because the um, job number counter clicked over uh, a few weeks ago and I went, oh, the job counter's clicked over. And I realised it had already done that four times in the year. Um, focus of this system is low cost and throughput. And this is the reason why we have CX1 and CX2. It seems a bit daft to have two separate systems. Um, but what we found out was that there's a compromise to be made between running very large MPI jobs on a stable platform that gives the performance and reducibility, re reproducibility of runtime um, and cost. And we have a lot of users who don't want to do those really big jobs. Um, so 
providing a smaller system more cheaply in addition to the larger one means our budget goes further. Um, and the nice thing about CX1 as well is that um, users with grants are able to buy bits to add to the system. So we give them a little menu and saying, well, you can buy these kinds of nodes and we'll give you a dedicated queue for your research group, if you like. And that's very popular. So um, last year we had um, an additional 35% of funding as a result of that, which is kind of nice because it means the researchers kind of trust us. I guess one of the reasons we, we are trusted by our researchers is that we are now in our 10th year and we're going to have a birthday party um, in the summer on the 7th of July. If you're in the country, you're very welcome to come along to the party. That would be very nice. Um, but it also gives them the opportunity to think, well, where are we moving from, from here? We've got 10 years of successful service. What are the next steps? So, well, we can just carry on doing, doing what we've been doing. Um, do users like it? Let's just, let's just carry on. Um, they do want more, though. And I think the scope for running larger simulations and larger models is uh, a quite a, um, there's quite a demand for that, which is not completely recognized. Um, and a lot of benefit could happen to certain kinds of research by running more or larger simulations. Um, we have our rolling replacement program, which gives us more cores each year, which, which is good, it increases capacity. Um, we do have constraints on space and finance, um, certainly keeping equipment for the lifetime of a grant. So if a user has bought some hardware to add to our system and their grant was for five years, they won't get any more money until after that. And keeping around a five-year-old server is a little bit challenging for us um, because our computer room is now full and we're kind of looking at the energy costs of running the older servers as well. Um, so we could do more of the same, but perhaps we should expand. Um, our traditional users could probably use more capacity. Certainly the new areas, particularly bioscience and social sciences, they don't really use HPC that much. Um, and um, I believe there's a strong demand for them to start moving into using HPC on a larger scale. And there's also a demand for running larger and better models. Um, these are all the kind of buzzwords that people tell me. They talk about larger molecules, more degrees of freedom, smaller time sets, higher Reynolds numbers, more complex algorithms. It's more bigger, better, larger. Um, and I think there's a good case, and the sci scientists themselves can make the case for um, doing that. So these are the kind of options we've got. A new computer room, where should we put it? Well, actually, talking about legacy, in the 1930s, the Olympic Games were held in London in a place called White City, and there was a stadium there. Um, now, the stadium was knocked down years ago, but actually it's a brownfield site which the university has now bought for a second campus. So the legacy of the 1930s Olympics means that we now have, or just starting to build, a new campus um, in the west of London. So it would be a really nice place to put a green computer room and to be able to uh, build a centre that's uh, very um, energy efficient. Um, our IT people are very keen for us to use colos, you know, somebody else's computer somewhere else. Um, I'm a bit concerned that they're not really suited for HPC hardware. They would like us to have things which are the same size and shape um, and the same power consumption. Um, and to do that for kind of five years or something. And I don't really want to do that because I might want to buy something that's in a wider rack or a deeper rack or has you know, 40 kilowatts per rack instead of 20. Um, and the colos aren't really there for us necessarily. I don't think we're their main customer. So the prices aren't fixed and it might be that in the future, if their regular customers want more space, we might find our prices go up as they try to um, uh, improve their profitability. There's the cloud. The cloud's rather nice because it's on demand. Um, that's really great. Some of the examples we had um, yesterday about running projects that would have taken months um, on in-house equipment suddenly being able to be done in a day or a month. I really like the talk by the guy from the um, financial uh, company at the end yesterday because he really gave a really great example of, uh, about how using HPC helped his business, helped him do stuff more quickly, improved the efficiency of their business, and um, actually it was quite easy to implement. 
So that was a really great example of the applicability of HPC to an area that perhaps most of us wouldn't immediately think was uh, an HPC area. So um, the problem with the cloud is it, the cost is a bit variable and the finance that our users get comes up front. They don't like paying as they go. They'd rather like to just give their money to me and um, then have something they can use for the duration of the project. So stay tuned. I might come back and give another talk about this at another point. Challenges. Software challenges. And I think hardware is the easy bit. You know, if it's cloud, if it's colo, if it's on site, it's the hardware that's um, the easy part. It's the software that we run on that hardware that's the problem. We're seeing more processors with more and more threads, but they're running more slowly. The processors are quite sophisticated, and they've got lots of levels of um, hardware acceleration. But it means that if you want to get the performance from these, you need to get all this stuff to work at the same time. So you've got three levels of loops that you need to optimize in your program in order to make, uh, to get the, the stated performance from those chips. Now, most of my users, they can do a bit of kind of loop optimization, but you know, they're really not experts at it. There's a similar thing with the memory. We're now getting lots of um, numer qualities about the memory, different levels of memory with different access patterns and access times and bandwidth. And the users are now having to take that into account um, in their programming. And I think there's a thing I've put user control buffers. This is the kind of thing that Intel are putting on the Phi chip where you've got a kind of a scratch pad memory which is under user control, which means the users have to program to use it. That's another thing they have to do. Now I do remember back in the, who remembers the Cray one? Hands up. Who knows what an SSD is? Okay, the one on a Cray, right? Not the SSD that you have in your laptop. There was a thing called an SSD that was basically a cheaper chunk of memory that was attached to the system that was user accessible, user programmable, just like one of, um, one of these things. So we do, have, uh, we do have some ways of using that. I think Fortran supports it. I'm not sure whether C or C++ are quite geared for that yet. But it's lots of extra programming for the users, and I think this is the challenge for us. Um, it's kind of hard. In fact, it's very hard, and our users are not really used to doing lots of optimization anymore. They're really kind of hoping the compiler's going to do everything. Um, so what I'm saying really, basically, is the skills, the computing skills to run HPC aren't as uh, highly valued, they aren't taught, they aren't as widespread as they need to be. And we, as an industry, need to look at that and somehow improve the overall skill set of, of the people who are doing HPC so they can take advantage of this new hardware. Um, it might be obvious, but I'm not sure our political masters and fund funders really know that. And the last thing is, HPC is a bit fragile. Um, we have to be careful not to break it. Um, so a good example is, some people will say, HPC, I'll just put it all in the cloud. Well, yeah, lots of HPC stuff can go in the cloud, but some of it can't. And we don't really want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so HPC has all these funny qualities of being difficult. And for example, IT people don't like that kind of stuff. They like things to be very consistent and very ordered and very regimented. And HPC can't be like that. You've got to have the flexibility to change your mind. You've got to have the flexibility to experiment with stuff and see whether it works. And if it works, buy lots more of it. And if it doesn't fit in your computer room, then to move stuff around in the computer room or put chilled water in or put three-phase electricity into your computer room. Um, so HPC is a bit special. And I think the industrial collaboration is a really important part as well. Um, it's the driver for HPC. There's pure research, but a lot of what we do these days is driven by um, industrial collaboration and development, and that we need to be, as a community, driven by the requirements of those areas to help make the world, world a better place. Um, and I think HPC's got a lot more to offer um, to the world than it's giving today, and I hope there's a big future for it. Any questions? Now, if there are no questions, I've got some movies. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. Yeah, one question. Can you kind of talk about your multi-year evolution to sort of centralizing more of the computing resources at the university as opposed to having everything in departments? Um, yeah, that was um, historical serendipity, I think, because we went in 10 years ago to start up a new service from scratch with no expectations from the users, many of whom had their own clusters in their closets. So we started a system up, got it all in and working. Then we went round to all of those individual user groups and actually spoke to them and said, well, look, there's some you know, other computers you can use if you want to have a go. And because we did that kind of engagement with the users, we um, installed their codes for them or the applications they wanted, made friends with them. And once they tried out the system, they went, oh, that's great. And I said, well, by the way, you know, if you're going to kind of buy some more cluster for your closet, um, why not give the money to us and we'll run it for you? And they kind of went, oh, yeah, that's actually rather good. So that's the way it happened. We kind of earned, earned our mileage, I think. No more questions? Good movie. Right. This is just some examples of some stuff that's done at Imperial in terms of um, the kind of research that gets done. And I think it's kind of nice to just have um, some examples of, okay, oh sorry. Okay, cool. I'm very good at breaking things. I started out in quality assurance. Um, I've got some little animations here which are about um, kind of work. This is a Professor Spencer Sherwin, who's basically a CFT guy um, working in aeronautics. And he's done some work which is um, in the biology field. This is actually the blood vessels. Um, this is the aorta. And this is the blood flow he's modeling using the same codes that he used to do modeling his airplanes but modeling the blood flow through the aorta. And the thing he's looking at is that this flow isn't smooth, it's turbulent. So you can see at the top, there's a bit of funny stuff going on around here. And that little bit actually goes backwards. And this is a bit of a problem, because if you've got a heart problem and they put a stent in there, that can make the flow even more turbulent and you can get a blood clot. Um, and that's bad, because you can die. Um, so. He's working on the design of the stents to minimize the amount of backflow you get there and therefore improve your uh, chances of survival after a heart attack. Um, by the way, this isn't a human heart, it's, it's a bunny rabbit. And in fact, one bunny rabbit did get it because they had to do some uh, in vivo studies. But it's not a human, so that was cool. I've got some others here which are about software development. So this is one of our codes from the AMCG, the Applied Modeling and Computational Group. Um, they have a fluid code. And what this is, is um, showing the software techniques you can use to make your codes go faster or more efficiently. And the thing about this code is that it has dynamic meshing. And you can see the simulation in color here. This is actually a wave going into a breakwater. Um, there's quite a lot of coastal erosion going on in Britain, and we're kind of concerned that we might turn into Holland and get washed away at some point soon. Um, so this is a design of breakwaters to um, help prevent coastal erosion. But see the way that the density of the mesh actually gets much, much denser where the action is happening. And the bits up here, which don't really matter, the mesh is really quite coarse. And of course, the thing that this really helps is that it speeds up the simulation. Rather than having to do the whole of the simulation at this really dense uh, level, you can cut out doing computation there and only concentrate on the, um, the areas where the action's happening. And of course, this means the amount of resources you need on your HPC are much less. So it's not just the size of the hardware, it's how clever your software can be. So just a couple of examples for you. Any more questions?